Good morning. Today, the committee will consider the nomination of the Honorable Patrice H. Kunesh of Minneapolis, Minnesota, to be the chair of the National Indian Gaming Commission for a term of three years. The president nominated Ms. Kunesh on July 23rd, 2024. She currently serves as the commissioner of the Administration for Native Americans at the Administration for Children and Families in the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Before we begin, I'd like to welcome Ms. Kunesh and thank her for joining us and thank her for always saying yes when being asked to serve. Uh, this hearing is an important first step in carrying out the Senate's constitutional obligation to provide advice and consent. It's an opportunity to learn how, if confirmed, Ms. Kunesh plans to carry out and uphold the United States' trust responsibility to tribes and oversight function of the National Indian Gaming Commission over Indian gaming. It's our duty to establish a record of the nominee's policy views on Indian gaming, how she sees her role as chair, her plans to maintain the integrity of the agency she would lead, and how she would engage with tribal nations on a government-to-government -government basis. The Indian Gaming Regulatory Act established uh, the NIGC as an independent bipartisan regulatory agency within the Department of the Interior. The chair of the NIGC has important statutory powers that are critical to the regulation of Indian gaming, including the power to approve class two and class three gaming ordinances or resolutions, the power to impose fines and order the temporary closure of gaming facilities, and finally, the power to approve management contracts for class two and class three gaming. This group, excuse me, this committee considered the nomination of former NIGC chair uh, Simmer Meyer, who was confirmed by the full Senate in 2019. The position of chair has been unfilled since the resignation in February of 2024. It's been almost 40 years since Congress passed the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act. Gaming technology has rap rapidly advanced over the decades from electronic bingo to online sports betting, and it continues to evolve quickly. Technology holds great opportunity, but with it, our regulatory challenges change and grow. The NIGC must adapt, and its chair, as the top Indian gaming regulator, must exercise their statutory powers while staying true to the commission's mission to promote tribal economic development and self-determination in their gaming activities. This is no easy task, but Ms. Kunesh is a proven leader who can and will achieve this important balance. The committee reported her nomination as ANA commissioner favorably, and the Senate confirmed her by a vote of 57 to 35 in February of 23. Ms. Kunesh continues to serve in that capacity and has done so with distinction. I'm confident that Ms. Kunesh will bring the same strong leadership and ethics to the position as she um, did in, uh, does in her role as ANA commissioner. The committee has received endorsements from tribes and tribal organizations supporting Ms. Kunesh's confirmation, and I've made them all part of the record today. I look forward to considering this important nomination and working with the vice chair and my colleagues to move this nomination through our committee. Vice Chair Murkowski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Ms. Kunish. Welcome back to the committee and congratulations on your nomination. As the chairman has noted, you're no stranger uh, here in the Indian, um, Senate Indian Affairs Committee in your current capacity as Commissioner for Administration for Native Americans. Um, you've appeared before us uh, on our oversight hearing on public safety needs. Uh, in 2019, you participated in a committee hearing to examine lending opportunities for tribal home ownership. I think it's fair to say that, that public safety and housing are, are top issues, certainly in my state, and I know it is for my uh, fellow colleagues here in the committee as well. So thank you for your work on these challenging issues and your continued commitment to serve. I do think it's important to talk a little bit about the commission that you're nominated to. As the chair has noted, the commission was established by the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act of 1988. It's an independent federal regulatory agency housed at DOI. The commission has a big job. It's responsible for protecting the integrity of Indian gaming from mismanagement and infiltration by criminal elements. It does this by monitoring tribal gaming activities at more than 500 casinos in 29 states conducting site inspections and processing background checks on tribal gaming employees. The NIGC also plays an important role in safeguarding gaming revenue for tribes, which must go towards supporting tribal governments and social services. And it's a big, big business. Revenues topped $41.9 billion last year. This is an increase of $1 billion in gross revenues from last year. And as the chair has noted, uh, that. The, the chairman of the commission is a, is a pretty powerful 
position with exclusive authority to levy fines and issue closure orders to tribal casinos that would violate NIGC regulations. The chair is also responsible for approving gaming ordinances and contracts between tribes and casino management firms. The mission of the NIGC takes on added significance given the tremendous changes that are occurring in tribal gaming industry today. In recent years, tribes have entered commercial gaming markets that were unimaginable when IGRA was enacted back in 1988. Today, several tribes own casinos along the Las Vegas Strip. Tribes have also entered the sports betting world. Some tribes offer sports betting apps for mobile devices, which is a rapidly growing industry. And I think it's a testament to tribes in IGRA that tribes have achieved this level of success in the gaming industry. But we know that there are bad actors out there that might threaten this success. Tribal casinos are targets for cyber criminals, including ransomware attacks that have caused millions of dollars in losses. And casinos, tribal and non-tribal, have long attracted human trafficking and illicit drug activity that prey on our nation's most vulnerable. So more has to be done to address the threats. I think we would all acknowledge that. So I'm looking forward to hearing from you this morning on your views about these matters uh, during this, this hearing. And again, thank you for your willingness to step up to this position. Thank you very much, Vice Chair. Senator Smith. Uh, well, thank you. I want to thank the chair and the vice chair in this committee for holding this nomination hearing today to consider the nomination of uh, Patrice Kunish, um, a descendant of the Standing Rock Lakota, to serve as chair of the National Indian Gaming Commission. Mr. Chair and vice chair and committee colleagues, I've known uh, Patrice for many long years. We've done much work together, and I can tell you, though you don't need me to tell you this because she's been before our committee before, that she is an exemplary public servant, and um, I know will do an excellent job in this role. Um, as you've noted, Mr. Chair, Commissioner um, Kunish currently leads the administration for Native Americans at the Department of Health and Human Services, but this is just her latest role um, in her lifetime of service to Indian Country. Just in the federal government, she's um, served in the Department of Interior, Department of Agriculture, and the Minneapolis uh, Fed uh, Bank Centers for Indian Country Development, as well as the Department of Justice. And at the Fed, um, Patrice oversaw saw some of the most important research that we've seen about the impact of gaming on tribal economies. So she knows firsthand the importance of gaming. And as attorney to the Mashantucket Pequot, she saw the origin of gaming and how it works at the tribal level. So I think that uh, you, uh, you have uh, an outstanding portfolio of experience to bring to this role. And I'm very grateful for your willingness to continue to serve Indian country in this new capacity. Thank you so much and welcome to the committee. Thank you very much, Senator Smith. Are there any other members wishing to make an opening statement? If not, Ms. Kunish, how do I pronounce your name exactly? Kunish, okay. Ms. Kunish, please rise and raise your right hand. Do you so solemnly affirm that the testimony you give today shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth under penalty of perjury? Thank you. Please be seated. I will remind you that we have your full written testimony, which will be made part of the official hearing record. Please keep your statement to no more than five minutes so that members have time for questions. Ms. Kunish, please proceed with your opening statement. Good morning, Chairman Schatz, Vice Chairman Murkowski, and distinguished members of the committee. Thank you so much for the opportunity to appear before you today as President Biden's nominee for the chair of the National Indian Gaming Commission. I grew up in a small town in central Minnesota. I'm the seventh of 13 siblings, the mother of two daughters, Unchi, a grandmother to the delightful Lucy Wintermoon, and they are my pride and joy. Two strong influences have shaped my three-decade career in federal Indian law and policy. One was my grandfather, and the other was my father. My grandfather was born in 1902 on the Fort Berthold Reservation in North Dakota, home of the three affiliated tribes, Mandan, Hidatsa, and Arikara. And he spent his early years at Fort Yates on the Standing Rock Sioux Reservation. He was enrolled at Standing Rock, as was my mother. And like most Native families at the time, his was impacted by painful separations due to federal Indian boarding school policies. It wasn't until 1924 that Congress passed the Indian Citizenship Act to confirm U.S. citizenship status on Native people, including their right to vote and own property. 
By then, my great-grandmother made the courageous move to Minnesota in hopes of a more stable life. My grandfather remained close to his family on Standing Rock, and his mother was buried there. It feels remarkable to me that his granddaughter was confirmed by the Senate in 2003 as the Commissioner of the Administration for Native Americans at the Department of Health and Human Services by a bipartisan vote. My father's work for local governments, both county and city attorney, involved cases involving social services and the criminal justice system. He was a strong advocate for Native youth and Native men who found themselves homeless or incarcerated due to federal Indian relocation and child removal policies. Their narratives, my grandfather's devotion to his homelands and my father's pursuit of justice, as well as my mother's ardent love for family, instilled in me a strong sense of vocation to become an advocate for Native rights. I began my law career at the Native American Rights Fund, a public interest law firm whose mission is to protect Native rights, resources, and lifeways. Then as in-house counsel to the Mashantucket Pequot Tribal Nation in Connecticut, I helped the tribe establish a judicial and regu regulatory infrastructure that continues to support its economic development, primarily centered around its gaming operations. As a professor, I taught courses on federal Indian law and gaming at the University of South Dakota School of Law. Then President Obama, President Obama appointed me to serve as the Deputy Solicitor for Indian Affairs at the Department of the Interior and later as Deputy Undersecretary for Rural Development at the Department of Agriculture, where I focused housing, broadband, and community infrastructure investments on reservation communities. And at the Minneapolis Fed, I led the Center for Indian Country Development, an economic policy research initiative that supports the prosperity of Native Americans. And in my current role as Commissioner of the Administration for Native Americans, I have the great privilege of making vital investments in Native communities to enhance their social and economic well-being. Native Americans, Alaskan Natives, Native Hawaiians, and Indigenous people of the Pacific Islands. Indian gaming provides indispensable financial resources to catalyze reservation economies and contributes to essential services for the health and well-being of Native peoples. Importantly, it also promotes nation building and good governance. If confirmed, I would focus my attention on three areas. First, fulfilling the mission of NIGC in promoting tribal economic development and maintaining the critical in, uh, integrity of the gaming industry. Second, I would endeavor to mitigate risks within the influx of new technologies and gaming formats, including online gaming and artificial intelligence. Third, I would be committed to good governance practices within the NIGC and ensure that NIGC has sufficient resources to fill its, fulfill its mission. It would be a great honor to extend my service to Indian Country as the next chair of the National Indian Gaming Commission and help lead this, this agency into the new era of Indian gaming. Thank you for your time today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll uh, defer to the <clears throat> Senator from Minnesota, Senator Smith. Well, thank you very much, uh, Senator Schatz. That's very kind of you. And um, thank you again, uh, Ms. Kunish, for being with us today. Um, I appreciate your opening statement and also the um, ways in which the uh, Chair and Vice Chair highlighted some of the opportunities as well as some of the risks around Indian gaming. And you have a unique perspective having been engaged in this for quite a long time. So um, let me just dive in a bit on what you identified as your sort of second priority, which is to minimize the risks of new technology. Could you um, talk a bit about how you see that from the perspective of cybersecurity and also um, artificial intelligence. Um, with cybersecurity, one of the most pressing issues in gaming today and tribes are in the difficult position of trying to react to existing threats and also prepare for new emerging threats. So could you talk a bit about the state of play as you see it around cybersecurity issues in tribal gaming and what actions you would uh, recommend uh, we should be thinking about as we address this challenge? Well, thank you for that really important question, Senator. And I do see that uh, technology has completely changed the way that the games are being played, literally, uh, with online gaming, sports betting, uh, the platforms in which we actually 
handle gaming, uh, handheld uh, digital devices as well as remote gaming. So with new technologies, there's an urgent need to that uh, the NIGC stay ahead of the technology with its regulations. And by that, I see um, the need to really look and take a, a strong view of what risks are, uh, are occurring around the safety and security of gaming. I think that's one of the most important uh, responsibilities of the NIGC. We know that in just a few decades, online gaming has, has surged in both popularity and profitability. Mm -hmm. And along with online gaming comes new platforms for financial engagement, financial transactions. So uh, tribes, tribal gaming operations are now the, uh, are, are holding vast amounts of data, personal sensitive information on their customers, but also responsible for ensuring the security of financial transactions. So if confirmed for this position, I think it would be uh, one of my top concerns, my top priorities to do an assessment uh, of NIGC to, uh, to evaluate their technology infrastructure, their technology work and programs, to make sure that the, that the full risk assessment is done to identify any weaknesses. We know also with the $41.9 billion, as Senator Murkowski mentioned, uh, the gaming profitability is increasing and that also weighs on a significant responsibility to make sure that the gaming industry, which has now become a financial industry, is safe and secure. In my experience uh, working at the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis, cybersecurity was their number one concern and investments could not, uh, um, uh, were ever increasing, not just in terms of financial investments, but the infrastructure around ensuring the systems are safe, secure, and reliable. And we do know that reputation is everything in this industry, and so any breach uh, would cause tremendous damage. So I take that very that very seriously, and it would be a top, con, uh, top priority you. for me. Thank you, thank you. Could you also address, um, when we met last week, I think it was last week, we talked a bit about uh, the impact and potential impacts of um, artificial intelligence in gaming. Could you just um, address that um, as well in the little bit of time that we have left? Yes, certainly. Artificial intelligence is changing everything that we do uh, in terms of uh, our engagement uh, and, and the artificial uh, ways that, not that I understand it completely, but the technology within art, uh, AI is, is really changing the way um, we engage and acquiring that knowledge, uh, pulling us further and further into certain behaviors. Uh, but it's also changing the way that we do business. We can use it in a smart way, uh, learning uh, to do things more efficiently, more, more uniformly, more standardized. We can also use artificial intelligence to analyze data. And that, anal that data analytics is an incredible tool to understanding the risk on the other side mm -hmm. of the gaming industry. So I think that the, the regulatory standards around technology generally, uh, online gaming, AI, really need to be a strong focus of the NIGC. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Vice Chair Murkowski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Kanish, um, thank you for responding to the question about cybersecurity. I think that overlays over so much uh, of what we're discussing about when we're, when we're talking about the threats to gaming. Um, but I think uh, we recognize that uh, while the primary influence of NIGC is to ensure the integrity of, of Indian gaming, it's also to protect it from criminal influence. And as I suggested in my opening comments, I worry about, um, uh, I worry about those who have been targeted for human and sex trafficking. Um, unfortunately, tribal and non-tribal casinos have been known to be targeted for that. Um, the Not Invisible Commission that Senator Cortez Masto and I worked on recommended addressing this through awareness and targeted prevention at casinos. Um, 
I do understand that NIGC partners with tribes, BIA, and DHS on initiatives like the Blue Campaign Toolbox that educates the tribal casino and hotel managers on how you spot and then how you report suspected uh, human trafficking at their establishments. Can you speak a little bit to this issue and whether you think um, uh, there are other initiatives that NIGC could look to uh, on this issue of human trafficking and, and the challenges um, and, and, and also whether there is more that uh, some of your partner agencies can be doing to address these issues. Unfortunately, uh, those of us on the committee here know that our native populations are at far too high a risk when it comes to being potential victims of trafficking and human abuse. Thank you for that question, Senator. And I do know that you have been a real champion in this space as well. And, and uh, it's made a difference. Uh, in my experience, having worked in this space for quite a while, human trafficking, missing, murdered indigenous women, uh, um, violence against women are some of the worst scourges in Indian country today. And unfortunately, uh, Native women, Native people tend to be the most vulnerable uh, and susceptible to, um, to these uh, terrible situations. We, I, I take uh, the responsibility to prevent uh, violence against women and addressing MMIP issues very seriously. In my current role at, uh, as ANA commissioner, I serve on the Not Invisible Act Commission. And I was part of the hearings. I was also part of the drafting of the report and recommendations. And uh, very specifically, we targeted uh, my agency, the uh, Administration for Children and Families, with uh, more than 100 recommendations to focus on these areas, to intervene and prevent, uh, to take action, and then to support the survivors and the victims with uh, appropriate services. So if I were confirmed for this position, I would like to build on the work of NIGC to strengthen the focus uh, of their activities in this area. It's part of the NIGC's overall public safety responsibility to ensure that the gaming premises are safe and secure. Um, and that means um, safe and secure from illegal activity like um, uh, human trafficking. I did ask a, a colleague of mine uh, who oversees the Office on Trafficking in, in Persons at AC, um, AC, ACF about what we know about the intersection of human trafficking and gaming, and there's not much data on it, unfortunately. Uh, I think that's one area that I would like to focus on is understanding that data better between uh, DHS and DOJ and the work that we do on the ground um, at ACF to really understand what is the magnitude or the prevalence. We have had... Uh, I ask you, and I, I know you've got to get confirmed before you can do any of all this, but I appreciate what you have just said there um, with these data gaps. And that was one of the things that we learned very, very clearly in the work that we did uh, together on the, the Not Invisible um, uh, so much of, of the challenge that we faced is we didn't know what we didn't know. And when it came to murdered missing indigenous, you know, it was actually um, the report out of Canada that first precipitated yes. our, um, the investigation by the, the, the Seattle, uh, let's say Seattle Institute, I'm drawing a blank on the Seattle Indian Health Board. Um, but we've learned a lot since then about these, these gaps in data. And so if you are confirmed, I would hope that you not only would commit to, to trying to understand a little bit more about these gaps, but then reporting back to the committee with us on that to see if there isn't more that we need to be doing from a legislative response. But I think that this is an issue that we need to know more about mm -hmm. to know the extent of the issue and, uh, and, and if there are different avenues that we can work to address it. So I look forward to that. Absolutely, Senator. I would very much appreciate the opportunity to, to look at this and to work with you and report back to the full committee. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Vice Chair Murkowski. Um, a couple of my questions were taken, so I'm going to go in a slightly different direction. You know, the good discussion about cybersecurity um, and hardening the defenses 
of uh, gaming operations. I get all of that. I guess I'm wondering whether the, <clears throat> just bluntly, my intuition is that now that gambling is ubiquitous, mm -hmm. um, that there may be small casinos um, that end up having difficulty um, staying afloat on the brick and mortar side. And so I just want to talk about the sort of long-term fiscal risks mm -hmm. for tribal governments. I get that there's been a spike in, mm -hmm. because everyone is gambling more, mm -hmm. but I also think that that could sort in a way that consolidates to the, to, to the big dogs um, and away from um, some tribal governments who are doing apps and all the rest. So I think they're surviving and even thriving now, but to me, the long-term trajectory to the extent that you've got your destinations like Las Vegas and a few other spots, and they, my understanding is a lot of their revenue is now non-gaming revenue and it's sort of an experience. Mm -hmm. um, but the idea that you would fly into, I'm not gonna name a town, but you'd fly into a city, you have a conference, and then you kind of go on Google and find the nearest casino, which is likely to be um, on reservation land. I'm not sure that the market is gonna stay the same and I'm quite worried about that. Uh, mm -hmm. And I'm wondering whether my intuition is wrong or whether we know the answer to that. Uh, Chairman Schatz, I think your, uh, your intuition is spot on and, and I, I think it's something that we really need to take a look at because gaming revenue is so vitally important to, to tribes and to tribal economies for those essential services. My understanding is that um, uh, the, the changes in technology are making uh, gaming, as you said, more ubiquitous, but the interaction uh, really um, uh, a very important component as well, and not only where it's done, but how it's done. I should say how it's done and where it's done. My understanding of uh, our, our, the range of, of, of new gaming formats like sports betting is also opening up opportunities for smaller tribes, maybe in remote locations, to be able to participate and diversify their gaming operations. Uh, of course, that depends on the state law in, in, the, uh, in the state in which the tribe is located. Um, I also see that uh, gaming in itself has to diversify uh, in terms of the human experience, the, the brick and mortar uh, facilities. Uh, it's a destination, as you mentioned, and, and they go there, uh, customers go there for relaxation, entertainment, uh, and so forth. So as, as much as it's becoming popular and profitable, uh, from an NIGC perspective, we want to make sure that um, that across the board, the tribes are uh, well regulated in whatever form of gaming they do. So I know you're the regulator and not the um, you know promoter, but I'm wondering whether you consider it an appropriate function for the agency that you will lead to kind of do a market analysis. I'm I'm not persuaded. It's not that I'm disagreeing with you. I'm just mm -hmm. not sure we know. I agree. Um, and I think that um, there are certainly states where the competitive advantage that a tribe may have is as simple as it's the only place it's legal, mm -hmm. right? And if it's legal pretty much everywhere now, at least using your your iPhone, um, to me, I, I, I just, I, I'm a little more worried than others about what this is going to mean over the long term. And I, if it's not your agency, then let's get our heads together and figure out who can do some analysis and figure out you know, is there a path forward to increase profitability and more scale because the internet is going to make this available to everybody and tribes are well positioned? That's the optimistic scenario. There's another scenario where, like I said, private equity just says, we're going to consolidate this darn thing. We're going to have the best app, the cheapest app, the, the lowest percentages that we take off the top, and we're going to just get to scale. And anyone who wants to do sports betting is going to use the app that's in the app store mm -hmm. that is the easiest and most um, you know, commonly, you know, uh, found and not go to a tribal app. So I'm worried. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure anyone else is worried. So I hope I'm wrong. I don't mind being wrong on this one. But I, let's do some analysis and, and, and get some smart people who understand the industry um, in the room to, to figure out whether we're about to, you know, fall off a cliff as it relates to gaming revenue. I, I definitely agree a market analysis is appropriate and, and likely uh, necessary to really understand where this is going in the next few years. 
one of the things that the NIGC does do is provide training and technical assistance. So to the extent this new technology is changing dramatically uh, the state of gaming, uh, I think there would be some discourse and dialogue about what that impact means. Okay, and I would just encourage anybody who's watching this, um, if I've got it wrong, just email my staff and oh, I'll, I'll be happy to read it. <laughs> <laughs> Senator Hoven. Thanks for being here today. Thanks for coming by and visiting with me yesterday. I appreciate it uh, very much. And um, like Senator Smith said, it's good to have you uh, coming from our part of the world. So we appreciate that very well with your ties to North Dakota, South Dakota, and Minnesota. Um, so a, a couple questions. Um, what would be your priorities if confirmed? What's your one, two, three priorities? Priorities. Number one would be uh, getting in and taking a look at the staff and the resources the, the NIGC has. Mm -hmm. um, I understand there's about 130 employees that oversee this almost $42 billion industry, working very closely with over 6,000 tribal regulators as well. So I'd really want to get an understanding of how the organization is situated and, and resourced. Uh, number two, I'd really want to take a look at uh, the state of the regulations. We recently had new regulations promulgated that added online gaming uh, options to tribal gaming operations. I'd really want to know how those are, are being implemented and any impact from those new regulations. And third, uh, I would really want to take a look at the uh, the public safety areas that we talked about earlier. Uh, the, the work that NIGC is doing around human trafficking awareness and prevention, looking at the partners that we have and, and determining, you know, if we can do more and, and how do we actually really uh, delve into that area, lean in hard. You mentioned 6,000 tribal regulators. How do you, uh, what's your thought in terms of building some kind of connection or rapport with them. A lot uh, of folks. Pardon me? You mentioned 6,000 tribal regulators in the industry. How do you build some kind of relationship or rapport there with so many? So the, the way I see it, and my experience uh, as being in-house uh, a council with the Mashantaka Pequot tribe, the tribal regulators are uh, on the ground at the forefront. They're the primary regulators of, of their um, gaming operations. They're essential to ensuring the integrity of the operation and ensuring that the tribes are the primary beneficiaries of the gaming revenue. So the NIGC is uh, is, is the federal regular with federal federal regulator. Excuse me with the Oversight Audit Investigation Authority. I do see it as a partner. It, uh, we need to make sure that uh, with the 527 gaming operations, that again, we have the sufficient resources and uh, properly enforcing uh, the gaming ordinances. Uh, but I do see it as a partnership and a necessary alliance to make sure that what's happening on the ground is in, you know, comports with the, the regulations. Um I think the artificial intelligence issue was brought up by uh, some of the committee members earlier, and you referenced it as well. NIGC has uh, a policy regarding AI. Have you had a chance to look at that? And I, I guess, uh, you know, how would you approach that AI issue, both in terms of what they've done, and if you haven't had a chance to mm -hmm. look at that yet, it might be hard to differentiate. But that, that's a big issue. It's a tough issue. It's complicated. H how are you going to approach it? Well, thank you for that question, and I, uh, I'm not at the NIGC, so I'm, I'm, not a, a, I'm not aware of how they're approaching AI, uh, but from my experience, uh, again, you know, going back to the, the Minneapolis Federal Reserve and the work that we're doing in the federal government, where AI is coming into every facet, every component, every function of what we do, we need to know what it is, how it works, and to make sure that there are human safeguards around uh, whatever product comes of it. Uh, it can do really well in a lot of ways, but the margin of error, uh, because it's artificial, uh, I think is pretty great. And how we use it and apply it, 
I think we need to know what, that there are safeguards in place. If somebody asks you, are you in favor of expanding Indian gaming or not expanding it, and I understand your role is as a regulator, but how do you answer that? How do you address that? Because it's a very dynamic environment, right? It's the a very community. dynamic environment. That is a challenge right now, figuring that out. Well, thank you for that, Senator. It is a very dynamic environment. And, you know, I go back and think about the, the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act, which provided, I thought, a very, very good framework and blueprint for addressing any sort of functions of gaming. And... Uh, I, I, surprisingly well, uh, it's folded in online gaming and digital gaming and, and sports betting. So um, I, I haven't uh, done any sort of full assessment of the, of the act, but what I, what I see and what I, uh, I, I have a sense of is that it's, it's, it's working well. But what I would be committed to, Senator, is understanding, again, the dynamics uh, and the pressures and the tensions on the law and uh, you know, working with you in this committee to see if there need to be any legislative changes going forward. Thank you. Before I I'll turn to the senior senator from Nevada, I just wanted to um, compliment uh, her and, um, and Senator Rosen on their work on both the Tribal Law Enforcement Act and this uh, Bureau of Justice issue that we are having, uh, not just in Nevada, but a couple of other states. Um, we're not done yet, but we're making good progress, and I really appreciate your leadership. Senator Cortez Masto. Thank you. Uh, thank you um, to the chair as well for the help that you've provided us in addressing this issue in Nevada. Um, it's great to see you. Thanks for visiting with me, and congratulations yeah, on your you. nomination. Thank you. Um, there's no doubt. I, I think you're well qualified based on your background, the conversations that we've had, uh, particularly around Nevada. So as, as a, somebody who's born and raised and actually um, worked with the attorneys who represented our Gaming Control Board and Gaming Commission, I have an appreciation for the work that you're going to be doing. So uh, I thank you for taking this on. My first question, though, goes back to what Senator Hoven talked about. In Nevada, having a gaming license, it's a privilege. And with that privilege comes background investigation and auditing. We have a gaming control board and a gaming commission. Commission does the licensing, control board does the auditing. You're doing both. Mm -hmm. And you have a small staff. Mm -hmm. um, in Nevada, our auditors, there's probably about right now in the gaming control board, last time I looked, about 98 in total. Mm -hmm. And there's 144 casinos. What you just talked about, um, and, uh, what I, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, you have a total of 121 full-time employees, mm -hmm. and you're, you are covering over 500 tribally-owned casinos. That's a big task, not just the licensing piece of it and the background checks, and, but the auditing, which is right uh, what we want to maintain, the integrity of Indian gaming industry. I would hope as you get there that you would come back and talk to us if you need more resources. This is key as we are moving into the conversation that we just talked about around sports betting, mm -hmm. online betting, sports wagering. These are new areas, even for Nevada, as we go into some of the online gaming, things that we are learning and our commissions are uh, actively engaged in. As you continue to move through this process, please come back to us and talk to us about the needs that, that you have, okay? Absolutely, and thank you for, um, for raising that, Senator Cortez Masto. I, I do believe that um, the resources at NIGC are absolutely critical, again, to ensuring the integrity, safeguarding the, the public safety and so forth. And it is my commitment, my, one of my top priorities, to really assess the, the need for additional staffing. One of the, I think, brilliant things that uh, NI, uh, the NIGC can do is raise um, fees on a scale of, you know, more profitability, you know, more f funds for the NIGC um, to pay for increased needs uh, of the Gaming Commission. And with increased responsibilities or uh, a, a dynamic gaming environment, that may be needed. But I will definitely come back and... Um, share with you my findings and work with you in case there are any changes needed. Thank you. And then if you would talk about, because I think what we've seen the benefits, obviously you and I have talked about um, the benefits to our um, tribal communities across the country uh, about having the opportunity to operate um, casinos and the revenue it brings into those communities and the benefit it provides. And part of your mandate 
uh, on the Gaming Commission really also is to help drive that economic development, find that balance correct. Uh, can you talk a little bit why this is so important? It is definitely important that, one, tribes are the primary beneficiaries of the gaming revenue, uh, but also that tribes are able to use those funds to support essential governmental services. In my experience, again, going back uh, to working with the Pequot tribe and other tribes, these funds help uh, support early childhood development programs, elder care services, uh, educational scholarships. They, they support the infrastructure of the tribe itself to give it the backbone to be able to function as a tribe, to exercise its tribal sovereignty. And one of the most, I think, uh, important demonstrations of tribal sovereignty is the tribal courts. And with the increase of gaming and, and the growth of gaming, for example, with the Pequot tribe, we saw a really uh, fundamental infrastructure develop around its judicial system. And that supported not only the customers and patrons and employees of the gaming enterprise, it provided a judicial system for the tribal members themselves. Yeah, it has made such a difference I've seen across the country. Um, I'm gonna uh, end with this. I agree with Senator Mikowski. The more um, information and data and education we can bring to our um, casinos and these types of establishments around human trafficking and the prevention of human trafficking and helping victims of human trafficking, I'm all for. I know you're on the com you were on the commission, yeah. and I thank you for your work there. Uh, that's why I'm pleased that you're going to carry that with you in into this new um, uh, position as well. It is key for us to really gather the data to have an understanding, but the education piece of that, everybody has a role to play, including our operators, and so uh, if there is an opportunity to continue that work where you are in this new position, we look forward to working with you. Well, thank you. I definitely support that, and also to thank the Senate, the Senate committee, for its work on law enforcement and public safety as well. Jurisdiction in Indian Country is very complex, and we do need more tribal law enforcement, and we do need coordination with DOJ and DHS when needed, and local law enforcement as well. So it, it, it's, it's an all-of-government approach uh, to ensure that reservations and Native people and the patrons of these uh, um, facilities are safe and secure and, and uh, protected as well. Thank you. Thank you. If there are no more questions from our uh, members for the nominee, members may also submit follow-up written questions for the record. Uh, and if we could do that promptly, that would be excellent. I'll also ask the nominee to respond fully and promptly to any follow-up questions, especially if you want to be confirmed quickly. Um, uh, and also to meet with any remaining committee members who may wish uh, to meet with you. The hearing record will be open for one week. We want to thank you for your time and your testimony today. This hearing is adjourned. Thank you.